discuss today is grounded theory, which is the most um, important and most famous research, uh, qualitative research design. And it's used frequently and it started, the whole con concept of qualitative research started with grounded theory and then it developed into many other types of designs. So this is the foundational uh, design of um, qualitative research. Now, you'll find um, grounded theory and, and you'll find specific names that are connected with um, qualitative research discussions and um, literature, basically. You'll find the names Glaser and Strauss a lot. You'll find the name of Stake a lot. Um, you'll get familiar with um, more and more of these uh, famous names in the realm of qualitative research when you dig deeper into um, research studies. This is just an introduction so to research, so we're focusing not on the literature of research, but more into the design of research. Uh, but I'm sure that you're going to take later on when you start to write your thesis for your master's, you will learn more about the literature uh, into each um, of these designs. But just to let you know that these are famous names in the realm of literature uh, in qualitative research. So according to Glaser and Struss, um, they describe grounded theory as a technique specifically designed to discover um, or to find a theory. Um, basically, in grounded theory, you see a phenomena and you want to theorize this phenomena. You want to come up with a common understanding that sets um, um, uh, a general uh, strong understanding of this phenomena. So grounded theory in, in that way is very systematic in grounding from the data a new theory and that hence the name grounded theory. Um, it is, it has a specific system um, in the nature of how it's designed. It's very um, systematic in the sense that the researcher finds a phenomenon and wants to explore it in order to theorize it. So the, 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 the researcher goes back and forth between observing, interviewing, and collecting data, and going back to this data and analyzing it in a very systematic manner. And we're going to talk in a bit about um, the data analysis process. But it's very systematic in the way it goes back and forth the researcher always goes back and forth between the data collection, collecting some data, going back, making sense out of this data and analyzing and categorizing them. And then they go back to the field to collect more data based on the understanding and the interpretation they made when they analyze the data. And then they go back again, um, categorizing the new second date sets of data um, and categorizing them under what they have interpreted or creating a new uh, category that that fits into the bigger picture and they go like this back and forth in a very systematic manner called constant comparative analysis where the researcher is constantly going back and forth between data collection and data analysis, comparing what they have first and then what they have in the second round and then making sense in the analysis phase at the very end of the whole big picture. Um, in this process, data are transcribed and examined for content uh, immediately following data collection. So, so um, 
the, the data is collected and then the transcription happens and transcribing in the sense of writing down everything that happened in an interview or in an observation. If, if it's an, in, an, in an interview, um, interviews are usually uh, taped record tape recorded and then transcribed in paper in order for the researcher to read between the lines more and be able to code and uh, categorize and we'll talk in a minute in, in further detail about the analysis and if it's an observation the researcher take anecdotal notes and bring back these notes and compare them with transcribed notes and make sure it's coded and categorized. So it's a cyclical process back and forth after transcribing data from notes and from um, recorded information. Anything that emerges is coded and categorized until the final uh, picture. The interviews that happens in, in, in this process is called semi-structured interviews and the reason why they're called this is to really show the different approach from an interview in a non-experimental quantitative uh, research and an interview from in, a, in a qualitative grounded theory approach. In the non-experimental, it is a typical interview of set questions and, and, um, and the participant answer these questions and provide them in uh, written dialogue to the researcher. But in a semi-structured interview from the word semi-structured it means that it is really not structured the questions are not set in stone and this provides the researcher the flexibility of asking a question waiting for an answer and maybe take question number five after question number one because this really relates more to what the participant had just said or it gives an opportunity for the researcher to ask a question that it's not even there in the set of questions as a follow-up question to clarify and dig deeper into a specific thought that the researcher might think it's important enough to dig deeper into it because it's leading somewhere um, uh, towards uh, a new uh, revealing uh, idea. It could be relating to a new idea that is related to uh, a previous data analysis from round one that it is will be helpful to uh, dig deeper into it and learn more into it. So semi-structured interview in a grounded theory is typical and it is most convenient for the researcher to understand more and collect more data um, from the participant without boundaries of a specific structure and sequence. Uh, and then after collecting all data, the researcher starts to code information and then categorize this information. We'll talk about it in a little bit in the data analysis, but I want to give you, uh, uh, first introduce you with, with um, design and then we'll talk about the data collection of this design and then the data analysis of the design. So right now I want you to understand what is grounded theory and how it is uh, perceived. So grounded theory is is really about theorizing a phenomena rather than just exploring a phenomena. I want to look at this phenomenon and I want to dig deeper to come up with a new, and the key word is new, new understanding to set for the general audience to understand a new um, perspective of, of things that is happening in, in society, things that are happening in the society. Now, this is the overall picture, grounding from data, 
and constant comparative analysis of data between data collection and data analysis. Now I created something for you um, to make sure that you add to your understanding to grounded theory is some of the key concepts and then the process. These are the key vocabulary or key concepts in grounded theory. The, the, the concept of grounded. Why did we call it grounded and what is the concept of grounded? This concept of grounded is, is stems from grounding from the data a new understanding of the phenomenon. And then constant comparative analysis is what we just talked about is part of the core understanding of how the researcher deals with the data collected. The researcher doesn't go ahead and just keep collecting data until the end and then starts analyzing. No, the researcher in grounded theory is constantly collecting and analyzing, collecting and analyzing in a systematic process to interpret and make sure they're grounding new ideas and new understandings. The analysis heavily rely on coding of ideas and categorizing ideas. Understand it in a bit. Just keep keep on um, hanging on with me. And then it that in the collection, it really relies heavily on semi-structured interviews. Um, because of the necessity to get collect more data from the participant as much as possible to gain more understanding versus structured interviews which wouldn't be helpful to um, to get or dig deeper into more thoughts and ground from the data new ideas um, and then observations are important um, and anecdotal notes are taken during observations in order to help the researcher find more information between the lines and, and help coding and categorizing new ideas. So these are the key terminologies and key concepts in grounded theory. Now we understand what is grounded theory. We understand the key concepts and terminology. Now let's put this in perspective in the process itself. And I created this for you to just make sure that you understand how the process goes. And I'm going to explain while I'm explaining the process. I'm going to give you an example from uh, research that I did based on grounded theory. So first, the researcher um, looks at a phenomenon, um, it looks at a phenomenon and then decides on the question and want to bring new concepts and theorizing this phenomenon. The researcher starts with collecting data. So the first thing, for example, from my my research, uh, that my grounded research, uh, was I wanted to examine or explore, see the vocabulary. I didn't say I wanted to experiment or study. I just wanted to e explore or examine an idea. I wanted to explore the teacher's perspective on the use of multiple intelligences in different cultural settings like schools in the Middle East, specifically in Egypt. So I went to Egypt and I wanted to discover a new phenomenon which is using multiple intelligences, a westernized teaching strategy in a Middle Eastern context and I wanted to see how teacher perceived this and how their 
might be some cultural barriers or not and whether there will be some tweaks and changes needed in the implementation of the strategy. So if you notice my questions, it's all about how, uh, what are the perspectives, how is it implemented, and how cultural context impact the integration of the multiple intelligences strategy. So that's the first step, setting, looking at the phenomenon. I want to theorize something. I want to see if westernized strategies are applicable or not when they are integrated and implemented in different cultural um, societies and, and a context specifically in the Middle East and whether this implementation is can be taken as is or needs to have some changes okay so that's I'm trying to theorize from that phenomenon something that bridges the cultural gap between the Middle East and the West now the first thing I thought about is I have to think about my data collection. How am I going to collect data and how can I make sure that my um, data will be trustworthy? Okay, the word trustworthy is the alternative of validity and reliability and we all understand now what is validity and reliability. Now in qualitative research, in order to ensure uh, trustworthiness of data collection and, and, and results at the end, it is always preferred to have a triangulation of data collection. And the word triangulation comes from the word itself, from the meaning itself. It's a trio, uh, corners of one triangle. You need to have, it's preferred to have three sources of data collection to ensure and complement each other. And as we said in part one video, qualitative data is very, uh, qualitative research is very interconnected. And you have to have these several data collection that connects, one connects to the other, one leads to the other. So for example, in this research, the same example, I wanted to have a triangulation so what I did is I used a questionnaire which is um, the survey in a non-experimental quantitative research. In a non-experimental quantitative research the survey is an integral part of data collection that will be analyzed but in a questionnaire in a qualitative research you are really trying to take a piece of the data collection to lead into the end. You don't take the questionnaire, um, you don't take a data from questionnaire to analyze. So for example, I wanted to, I had a large pool of participants and I wanted to make sure that the participants that I'm going to pick are the ones that I want to interview in the next Step. So I used questionnaires, asked specific questions, and then eliminated the participants who had specific answers that I didn't want and specifically collected participants who answered um, um, in a specific manner um, my questionnaire. I asked about the, the number of experience, I asked about their um, experience in use of uh, multiple intelligences. I asked about uh, originality and belonging to the Middle Eastern culture. All of that added to the um, data elimination of participants. So once I had my first data collection, which is the questionnaire, and I picked my participants, I moved to the next step in the triangulation, which is semi-structured interview. I interviewed teachers and um, asked them questions 
and recorded the conversation together. And I purposely call it conversation because the questions are not rigid. So I ask a question and then when they say a specific answer, I like to give a feedback or I like to give a follow-up or I like to go back and forth between questions and manipulate them the way I want. So it's a smooth conversation based on questions that I have in my hand. So it's not random questions. I have questions in my hand. However, these are flexible questions that I can manipulate in order to get the answers um, I'm looking for and enable me to dig deeper into data. Now, after I finished my interviews, I started, I went back to um, my office and I started to look at what I have from the interviews and from the transcriptions. I transcribed everything that was recorded um, from the participants and started to read and see what I can find. After reading everything first, I reread, which is something very important. A researcher has to read and reread as part of the data collection and data analysis and grounded theory. So after I reread, I started um, to have color codes for each idea that reoccurs around the same bigger idea, if you may say. So if a part if participants, different participants started to talk about um, students' behavior in the classroom. So every time I saw an, a participant talking about student behavior, I gave it the color red. So I kept reading and reading and I gave the color red for every time I see the idea of student's behavior and then um, gave the color green for every time I saw a participant talking about administrative support um, and I gave the color yellow for every time I saw a teacher or a participant talking about uh, professional development. So after I finished color coding in my rereading, I went to my third data collection and I went back to the field. And the third triangulation of data collection was classroom observation. And this complemented the first two in the sense that now I want to see what reality is in the classroom. Any teacher can say anything about how their classroom runs, but I had to make sure that I understand them correctly and I had to make sure that they perceive things the way they are in real life. So I went to their, to each participant's classroom and took anecdotal notes of the classroom and what happened in the classroom following specific procedure that I had designed for my own observation um, in the field. I took my notes for each participant to complement my understanding of the overall picture. Then I went back to my data analysis and reread the codes that I had and put some comments and added more codes or eliminated um, um, or merged some codes together based on a new understanding that emerged uh, from the field uh, from my second round in this constant comparative process. At the end, when I finished my triangulation and after I looked back at my codings, I started to think about the next step in the data analysis, which is categorization. Now I finished with my data collection, I finished with triangulation, and I have codes I wanted to think about some categorization and by the way it's optional and it's preferred you can go back and do another 
set of interviews, which could be reflective interviews with the participants after you finish the observation. Or you can just go ahead and start categorization. Actually, for my research, I chose to do a second round of interviews with the participants after the observations, just to make sure that I understood what I understood correctly to increase the trustworthiness of my um, data analysis later on in my results um, and ensure that it was less subjective and less interpretive from my part. So I, I discussed things, what I saw, and what they think happened in the classroom, and whether they wanted to add something, or they feel that something went wrong that wasn't the norm, or anything. You just provide them with an, another chance to speak more about um, their perspective. Now you go back to, uh, to your categories and check that you are collecting all of your red codes together and put them in in um, index card professional development um, students behavior uh, administrative support and then under these coded categories I added everything each participant said under this part until uh, until sets of themes start to emerge. Now I understand that teachers needed more from understanding under this category and from reading all of the transcribed information under this category, I understood that teachers needed more professional practical professional development in the use of multiple intelligences based on an understanding of the culture. So all teachers said that they gave us the highlights of the strategy, but they never dig deeper with examples based on knowing the nature of the students here in um, Egyptian schools, for example. So that was my first theme, professional, practical professional development, for example. Um, some participants talked about family understanding and support. So that was another theme. So from the codes, you come with categories. When you come with the categories, you put them in index card docs, kind of, with the different transcribed information each participant said. said and you um, um, uh, keep them this way, reread through the transcribed information under each category until you emerge into the last step of thematic uh, analysis where you have a theme, an idea, which will be in your writing, your proposal, or your um, uh, research, it will be uh, a subheading. So you'll say results and then you'll talk about your codes and your categories and then you'll um, divide your paragraphs into your themes. The first theme emerged was and then you say the, the theme in a subtitle and you discuss the theme underneath with what you found and what participants said in a discussion or a dialogue format. Okay, so this is basically the steps of a grounded theory from data collection triangulation to comparative analysis to coding and categorization. If you look at the steps here, it will explain this um, in, in a simplified manner and then you can take notes of what I um, just said and I wrote it down for you here, which which I will be um, adding, or I think I added already uh, under week 10 uh, lecture, qualitative research lecture. 
So if you will ask me, then what are the, uh, oh, let me go go back in a minute and, and just talk about when you're doing the analysis and you're discussing in the, under your themes, you want to make sure that you describe in your data analysis that you are doing both emic and edic um, transcription of data or analysis of data. The meaning of emic is that you are providing information from the participant's perspective, from the insider's perspective. And then you are also providing the edict, which is the researcher's perspective and interpretation of these perspectives. So in the grounded theory you, and in case studies as well, and in general and qualitative, you always want to make sure that you are providing the audience or the reader with what the participant actually feels and what he thinks realities are. And then you provide the edict, which is your own, as a researcher, your own interpretation of this um, emic perspectives. Okay, so if we go to the headings for grounded theory, when you're writing your proposal, you'll have to write a mini introduction about what is the design that you're using for this research. You'll say that this is a grounded uh, theory research design, and then you tell me the matchability. I'm sorry, I need to um, check my uh, spelling in, in in um, several pieces here. So the, how is it m matching with your research? How is the research becoming a grounded theory and why do you think that? And then just tell me um, what is your, what do you think is where the problem is or your hypothesis? And in qualitative, you call it the foreshadowed problems or your hypothesis of the problem. Uh, then the second piece, you always want to talk about your procedures. What are you going to do exactly? In qualitative research, it's very important that you state the procedure. How are you going to, um, find participants. So, for example, in, in that research, the same example that I just provided, um, I can say that I wrote letters for schools to tell them about the research that I wanted to uh, explore, and then they provided me with um, entrance to their uh, ELO departments. Uh, then after that, I gave all ELL teachers in this department the questionnaire in order to select from them who is going to proceed forward with the research. And then after I decide, and then you go on with the, with the process, you explain to me how did you decide after reading the questionnaires and then how are you going to do the interviews or where are you going to interviews and whether you're going to record the interviews or not and then you go on with the explanation of the steps okay after you explain the procedures you're going to go to the data collection and how it's triangulated what are the um, data collection sources that you're going to use. And then the next subheading will be the data analysis. You're going to talk about, if you chose um, grounded theory, then you're going to talk about constant comparative analysis and how you're going to do this. Tell me what is the constant comparative and then tell me how you're going to do this, like I explained in my research. Um, 
and 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 you're going to talk about um, um, coding and categorization. You're going to talk about the EMIC and EDEX. So these are subheadings of the subheading data analysis. Okay, and then the last subheading will be the trustworthiness or the validity. How are you confirming trustworthiness of your research? Okay, um, these are your your subheading. I'm going to add this into our uh, proposal sheet here. Uh, that we've been uh, using. I added more and organized it a little bit and I'm adding design number two which is qualitative grounded theory case study. So the grounded theory I'll put the headings and subheadings here and then the case study I'll put them here and I'll add them to week 10. I'll add this form, uh, the steps uh, of proposal to week 10. Every time we add to it in a new week I'll add it to that new week. Okay so we're done with grounded theory. We understand what is grounded theory. We understand the key terminology. We understand the process. And we discussed the process through the, uh, an example that I just gave you from our research. Um, and then we discussed the, the steps of writing a research proposal um, using grounded theory. Okay, let's go to the second type. Uh, second um, type of design in under qualitative research, which is case study. And from the the the, the word itself, case study, you are really studying a case. Um, a one case of a human being or a one case of an institution or a one case of a program or a one case of a school or um, a couple or three cases maximum uh, of, of human beings, institutions, programs, or schools. Okay, so it's a, it's a case-based analysis, basically. Um, the in in qualitative case study approach, you are describing in depth and analyzing um, a specific person or an organization or an institution, but in a quantitative research, you're really looking at measurable data of a specific situation that is um, um, that is um, occurring and happening based on an experiment in, an experiment that you are designing. Um, most frequently case studies are used in qualitative research versus quantitative research and it's, it has um, different categories that we're going to talk about in a minute. Now, case study research can be uh, complex if you are choosing a couple of cases to compare them together and match them together, or it can be simple, um, more simpler when you are discussing only one um, case and focusing on that case. Also, the time period adds to the complexity or the simplicity of, of uh, the case study. If you choose to have a longitudinal um, case study research, then it means it's in a, over a long period of time. This adds to the complexity because of many validity issues that we all know related to longitudinal studies. If it's more simple, it means that you are choosing to collect data over a short period of time that could be a few months only versus a whole one year or several years uh, consecutively. Now, case studies, which is the most important part that you really need to understand about case studies. We understand now that case studies are based on studying a one case or a matchability of a couple or three 
uh, cases. It could be a human person or an organization or institution. We know now that there are complex and simple case studies. Complex are the ones that are studied over a long period of time, studying several cases. And the simple one is more of a short sample of time studying one case or a couple of cases. Now, when we decide on using a case study, a researcher has to really decide on the category that this study, case study will, um, will move forward uh, towards. Is it an exploratory um, research? Is it a descriptive case study research? Or is it an explanatory? case study research. Okay, if you are exploring, if you decided to explore, then you are basically set to explore a phenomenon. That's it. I want to explore this phenomenon. For example, does an ELL student utilize reading strategies when reading a text? I just want to explore if this student usually this ELL student, for whatever reason you found an interest in that one ESL student, you're going to explain this in your research, of course, but you are studying this student and you want to explore if they are capable or are actually um, using reading strategies when they're reading any text. Okay, and if so, how often do they do this? This is a simple case study research. You want to know this ELL student who will probably have been here in the program, but maybe is not improving or achieving as you would think. So you want to explore. Is this student using reading strategies? How often do they do this in order to come up with set of results to understand why the student is not really achieving, okay? Uh, the research here, if you're doing an exploratory case study, you really have to understand more and set the stage for the case before you go ahead and start exploring this case. You want to have a pilot, maybe understand more about the student. Tell me more about the story of this student and why did you specifically raise an interest to explore this student. So you have to set the stage and then you start to explore um, this, this student case. Okay, now let's go to a descriptive. If you are a researcher who wants to venue into describing a case, then you are really describing a naturally occurring phenomenon. Something is happening already naturally and you want to describe it. So you want to describe what different strategies is this ELL student using while reading a text and how does this student use it. Okay, so you are describing what are they and how they're used okay the, the the researcher will be basically narrating things and describing things to the audience rather than exploring and finding new foundations you are actually narrating things that are happening and you're just telling me about them. in the third category you are doing an explanation so you're more of an examiner here uh, of the data okay you are explaining the phenomena you want to add a new understanding to the to the phenomena so the example here why this ELL student using this specific strategy about inferencing, maybe using inferencing tools and inferencing techniques when reading a text. You want to theorize to build a new hypothesis of understanding of maybe the importance of inferencing techniques for ELL students who are um, learning the language 
in their third year of learning English, for example. So you're giving me an explanation of things that ELL students at this stage of learning English go through and preference of inferencing and why is this student preferring inferences to give me solid explanation maybe to help other teachers to focus on this specific strategy for example okay so if you in a case study if you do not know what is the category that you are following in this case study then you are going to be lost between maybe narrating for a little bit and then exploring a little bit more and then explaining again so you'll go back and forth and this is not a typical case study in a typical case study you have to first set the tone of what is your purpose what is the category that you are following in that case and then you set the stage accordingly if you are exploring then you tell me more explore more about this case tell me more about it and then explore about the phenomenon that you want to uh, study if you are describing then i want to see more narration detailed description of what is happening to the student and if you are if, um, explaining something then i want to see more of an examination of a phenomenon and i want to, to see uh, a theorized result at the end you're coming up with something, a new finding, rather than just exploring or describing. I want to see a new finding if you are explaining a phenomenon. Okay, um, now let's go and understand more about the key words and the process of a case study. The key words of a case study that you want to make sure you know is that it's a holistic in-depth behavioral study the researcher who decides to do a case study is really looking for the overall picture of a specific behavior and and dig deeper into it okay rather than um just brushing into a specific uh, small detail i want to know everything in depth about the behavior of this institution or the behavior of this person or the consequences of or the efficiency of this program so i want to look at every aspect holistically and dig deeper into each of these aspects to understand um, something at the end, either understand or describe or explore new findings. Um, it's an empirical inquiry that investigates real life phenomenon. So it's a case. And because it's a case, it means that it's something that's happening in action and you are empirically inquiring and investigating to learn more about this case now as we said in the levels of complexity in case studies either it's a single case or a multiple case design so you'll have to state this as part of your explanation of your case study is it a single case study or is it a multiple case design and if it's a multiple case design then you have to understand how you're matching um, uh, each case with the other in order to find a common result at the end and we'll discuss this when we come to the process and how you collect the data and analyze it in the levels of complexity again is it longitudinal description or it's an analysis of changes uh, on us in a short period of time if it's longitudinal description then it's over a long time if it's just analysis of changes then it's on a short period of time um, triangulation in again as we said in any qualitative research design is essential to achieve trustworthiness 
um, you can do triangulation of data collection in a single case uh, study, or you can do a uh, triangulation of data collection in the multiple case study. And with the multiple case study, you do this pattern matching that I was just um, telling you about. We're going to explain it in the process in a minute. Um, you do uh, matching between cases, looking at the different patterns that happens and reoccur from one case to another. And then the sixth uh, keyword that, or concept that we need to make sure we understand is that there are three categories and you'll have to pick and lay the ground forward into what category that uh, are you following in your case study. So it's an in-depth, it's an empirical inquiry, it could be one case, it could be multiple cases, and it could be longitudinal, and it could be short, and it has to follow triangulation to ensure trustworthiness, and you have to state the categories. Okay, let's look at some examples of studies that can be taken as a case study research. So you're studying the effectiveness of an educational program initiative. A new program that your school is probably implementing and you want to study the effectiveness of this educational program you can take this as your case your case is the program initiative and you want to explore maybe that's your category right here the effectiveness of the education program or if you think that it's achieving then you want to maybe explain why it's achieving in that sense so you're going to have a category of a explanation or if you are describing how the program initiative is is happening or implemented in the, in the school then the case will be descriptive and you want to learn more about or you want to tell the reader more about how it's implemented so the category makes a huge difference in the choices of your data collection and in the way you are going to analyze your data at the end. Um, if you want to look at child language development, you want to explore the development of this child, so you're going to take him as your case and you're going to um, study this case. Number three, the reading process of one subject or one student of our period of time. So that this will be a more of a longitudinal study where you're going to look at the reading processes of, of one subject. Number four, whether the goals of a specific program are reached or not. And you can do this as a longitudinal case where you want to see if the um, long-term goals are achieved and students are actually at what they're supposed to be at when they use this uh, educational program. Okay, so let's look more at the process. Now, the data collection and the data analysis in the case study is very much the same as in um, grounded theory, it's just that it differs in the constant comparative interpretation of data in the grounded theory versus more of um, deciding the purpose and the purpose leads you to words um, linking hypotheses in, in the data analysis versus really going back and forth. So let's let's start one by one. So you decide on the purpose, you decide on uh, your question first, you decide on from that question and the problem, you think of the purpose and from that purpose you decide on the category. Which category are you following to um, gain or understand more um, about your questions 
Is it an explanatory? Is it descriptive? Is it exploratory? Which category I'm going to use? Then you have to set the grounds and tell me more about your uh, participant. You start after you set the tone, you start with your triangulation of data collection. You are you can interview the participant and then in a semi-structured of course um, if it's a, a program that you're studying you're you're interviewing participants who are actually working in this program they are um, uh, the tools of implementation of this program so you're interviewing them in semi-structured interviews you are observing the program or you're observing the student or you're observing whoever the case is and then you can the third data triangulation could be uh, looking at documents uh, looking at um, documentations to understand more about the program or to understand more about this student or this case and gain more uh, background information to support your data collection. So the triangulation of data is the same as in grounded theory, but you're not going back and forth like the constant comparative analysis in a, in a grounded theory. You're just doing the process. It could be by step by step, or it could be all um, parallelly going um, all together around the same time. You'll explain this in your uh, procedures section, if it's one after the other, or if you're doing this simultaneously uh, all at the same time when you visit the schools or when you visit the institution or whatever your case is. Um, through your uh, data collection, you are constructing knowledge and synthesizing the information from the data that you're collecting and transcribing, either from the transcripts of the, of the interviews or from the uh, anecdotal notes that you took from observations or documentation um, reading. Once you are at that point and synthesizing and summarizing and making sense of your data collected, you are ready for data analysis. And when you go to data analysis, it's again the same as in grounded theory. You will be coding first, looking at the reoccurring incidents or the reoccurring um, concepts or overall um, ideas that that's happening and again it depends on your case if it's a student then reoccurring things that he or she has said to you or reoccurring behavior that she or he are exhibiting uh, during your case so you're coding that after you code you will categorize each code under a specific key concept and put all related data under this and your index cards docs and then themes start to emerge if you are using a narrative descriptive category case study then you are reporting your results and your categories not in uh, not rigid themes but more of a narrative one leads to the other one incident leads to the other or one situation is leading to the other but if you are doing exploratory or explanatory then you are doing the thematic um, uh, rigid um, separation. In the narrative, you'll have the themes, you'll discuss the themes, but in more of a uh, narrative tone, if you may say. You're describing the themes as they emerge and the things that you see as they emerge. And I encourage you to 
uh, research um, articles in the library to see descriptive case studies or narrative case studies and read one of them to see how um, they, they reported the thematic analysis that, they, uh, that the researcher has uh, found in, after data analysis. Um, at the end, the case study researcher does something called member checking, which is the EMIC and EDIC analysis. You're, you're checking your understanding, which is the EDIC part, with the EMIC part of the member that you are, you are studying. You're checking with them, is this what I understand? Is this what I see? What do you think about this? And this is part of your um, data analysis in the EMIC and, and EDIC uh, section. And then at the end, you profile your, your discussion or results um, talking about this case. And you emphasize, and that's very important, you only emphasize in a case study that it's not generalized result. This is only based on this program that is implemented in this specific school or about this student who is studying in this specific setting, okay? It is very important when you're reporting the result at the end uh, and discussing the result at the end, you are telling me that this is a not generalizable finding. And you can discuss this too under trustworthiness of the research, together with ensuring that it's trustworthy because you're doing your data triangulation and you're doing your member checking in your data analysis. Triangulation in data collection and member checking and unique and edic in the data analysis. But it's not generalizable, so that's all under your trustworthiness. So when we come to here and you want to look at the subheadings you're doing the same subheadings you're doing the introduction of what is your research design and how it's matchable to um the, the how is the design matchable to your to your research question and again guys i know that your research might not be uh, perfect for a case study, then choose the grounded theory. If it's not perfect for grounded theory, then you can choose the case study. And if it's not really matching that much with um, either, you want to just for the purpose of this proposal to take the theme, the main problem that you're studying, and tweak the questions to make it a grounded. All of the questions can be asked in a quantitative or in a qualitative format to make it uh, applicable. And we talked about the difference between questioning in a quantitative and questioning in a qualitative. In a qualitative, you're asking more WH questions that are um, generic. How does a person feel? How is this achievable? Uh, why is this situation happening? Or why something is happening? Uh, what are the consequences? All these WH questions that are uh, not specifically me measurable, but in a quantitative, you're asking how um, um, much something. You, your questions are more uh, data numerical driven rather than just understanding uh, a general phenomenon. I refer to uh, video one for this part. So make your tweaks to fit your theme with the design that you will choose. You're going to um, discuss the procedures. Tell me more about what are the sequence of your procedures, which is very important and qualitative for replication purposes. You're going to talk about data collection with its subheadings under the subheading. And it's right here. I'm just not repeating myself because they're the same, so I just wrote it this way. But you have the explanation of each one. 
and then the data analysis, which is right here. In the case study, you're not going to write com constant comparative analysis, right? You are going to uh, tell me more about your um, uh, hypothesis and the emic and edict and coding and categorization. And then validity or trustworthiness at the end. Um, I want you to make sure that you listen to the videos and start the skeleton of your paper with changing or tweaking your question a little bit to fit into the design that you choose. And then ask me questions if you have questions because your questions are going to be case specific to your own case to your own specific research do not wait until the last minute and start writing your paper and then you'll have all sorts of questions that i can't answer at the last minute so make sure that you're experimenting now to understand or to make sure that you understand uh, well i give you examples uh, through my explanation, I have a lot of um, handouts that are going to be available for you this lecture right here. And then um, this handout that I created for you for the steps and the keywords for each one of them. And um, also provided is the sequence uh, steps of proposal. I'm going to add under week 10 as well with the new added uh, sections. And of course, the PowerPoint. Uh, we talked about data collection for each one of them, the interviews, the observations, the questionnaires, and you can choose focus groups if you want for grounded theory. You can choose a focus group to have, uh, rather than interviewing one participant at a time, you can have um, 10 people to interview all together, which generates more discussions and more data um, uh, rich environment that you can add uh, more to your data uh, collection. And that's called a uh, focus group. When you have a group of people together versus one participant at a time, and you do your, your interviews with them and your discussions with them. So you can use focus group as your data triangulation. Now, I forgot to say something um, in grounded theory. In a case study, you collect your data using your data collection triangulation, and then you go right away and start your data analysis. But in the constant comparative nature of grounded theory, you're going back and forth. And one person might ask and say, well, how long does a researcher keep going back and forth? Do you go back and forth forever, or how is this happening? You go back and forth based on, first, your triangulation of, of data collection. You collect the data first time, and then you go and, uh, and analyze this piece of data. And then you go to the next data collection, and you come back for data analysis, and you go to the, your third data collection, triangulation, and then analyze. Now you want to understand that you collect data until what's called data uh, saturation. You keep interviewing in this semi-structured interview, but then you stop at a, at a stage where things are repeated now. I need to stop or um, you're choosing your participants and now it's a repeated participant he has nothing unique that will be added so that's data saturation right here or maybe you're uh, deciding to do a fourth round of interview um, uh, data collection as, a, as a, another interview as i told you you can choose it's optional to do after the observation to do another set of uh, interview because you wanted to check on things or you say you know what no I have saturated data now it's repeated there is nothing new added so I'm not going to do any further um, data collection so data saturation is a unique part of data collection and data analysis 
in grounded theory. The researcher doesn't go on and on and on. The researcher wants to dig deeper and deeper and deeper until the moment where he stops or she stops uh, because of repeated data. And once this data is not giving me anything new, I call I call it saturated data. So you can say um, I collected data until data saturation, or I interviewed participants until I stopped interviewing anymore because of data saturation. So I just wanted to make sure that I uh, inform you with this keyword that you might see, maybe you might not use, but you might see in quality to grounded theory research papers. We talked about data analysis, coding, categorization, and uh, recognizing the relationships to come up with new hypotheses and themes. And I highlighted that qualitative process is highly interactive. One piece leads to the other. These are not separate pieces that each one brings a new set of data, but rather one feeds into the trustworthiness and the, the um, and adds to the quality of the second piece and so on.